At the height of World War I, Great Britain faced a critical shortage of acetone, the chemical needed to create the explosive in artillery cartridges. American shipments were cut off by German U-boats. And without acetone, British troops couldn't fire their guns, a big problem in the middle of a war. A young man named Winston Churchill was in charge of the British Navy, and he had heard about a chemist in Manchester who could help. The chemist later wrote about their first meeting. Mr. Churchill, then a much younger man, was brisk, fascinating, charming, and energetic. Among his first words were, well, doctor, we need 30,000 tons of acetone. Can you make it? I was so terrified by this lordly request that I almost turned tail. Instead, the chemist went to work. He had already invented a way to create acetone by fermenting grains, potatoes, and even chestnuts. So he worked day and night to reproduce it in mass quantities. And soon, the British were producing 90,000 gallons a year in breweries and distilleries commandeered by the government. The chemist who saved the British Army was a Jewish man named Heim Weizmann, a Zionist leader who would one day become the first president of the State of Israel. Weizmann was born in 1874 in the Russian village of Motol. He was one of 15 children from an Orthodox Jewish family and one of nine who made it all the way through university. In Russia, the Jews couldn't go to universities. So high education for Jews was something that impossible. So if you want to remain Jew, but in a better condition, you have one direction, West. Like Chaim Weizmann, he went to Germany to learn science. In addition to studying chemistry, Weizmann developed a deep interest in Zionism. Every year, he came to Basel to attend the Zionist Congress. He was here in 1903 when his hero, Theodor Herzl, dropped a bombshell on the crowd. I remember one deeply significant detail of the stage setting. It had always been the custom to hang on the wall a map of Palestine. This had been replaced by a rough map of the Uganda Protectorate, and the symbolic action filled us with foreboding. Then Theodore Herzl took the stage and presented the British government's offer to resettle the Jewish people in Uganda instead of Palestine. Weizmann was appalled and joined the Russian delegation in a walkout. The so-called Uganda plan was a disaster but in it, Weizmann saw a small ray of hope. On the other side, he said, well, something very interesting happened here. Who is behind this proposal? For the first time, a power, one of the most important powers of the time, or the most important one, Britain, thinks we are serious, speaking with us as a national collective. This is something that never happened before. After that, Weizmann believed the British might be the Jews' best chance for a state. So in 1904, he took a position at the University of Manchester, his home for the next 30 years. For someone like Chaim Weizmann, during, to go to England during the Uganda crisis, is something very, um, can I say, stupid? <laughs> if you want to be a leading Zionist, you know, leader, so please stay in Paris or in Vienna or Berlin or Geneva, but to go to Manchester, you know, it's... Who heard about Manchester? It's like you exile yourself. Especially if, uh, someone like Weizmann who want to be a Zionist leader. And this is what he wanted to be. He didn't want to, to, to be a, you know, a big scien scientist. He wanted to be also a successor. That's what he wanted to do. As it turned out, 
Manchester was the place where Weizmann would make one of his most important friendships, the former British Prime Minister, Lord Arthur Balfour. In 1906, Lord Balfour was campaigning in Manchester, and a friend introduced him to Heim Weizmann. The two talked for more than an hour, and almost immediately, the conversation turned to Uganda. But the Russian Jews need a safe haven immediately. Why not British East Africa? The survival of Zionism is based on a spiritual conviction. And that conviction is based on Palestine. And on Palestine alone. If Moses had been here when they had proposed Uganda, he would surely have broken the tablets once again. <laughs> Mr. Balfour, supposing I were to offer you Paris instead of London. Would you take it? <laughs> Dr. Weizmann, we have London. That is true. And we had Jerusalem when London was nothing more than a marsh. Are there many Jews who think like you? I believe I speak the mind of millions of Jews who cannot speak for themselves. If that is so, Dr. Weizmann, then you will one day be a force. Lord Balfour had gone into the meeting hoping to change Weizmann's mind, but instead, he became the convert, and the Jewish people gained an ally in one of the most powerful men in England. In 1910, Weizmann became a British citizen and would remain one until he became the president of Israel in 1948. When World War I broke out, Zionist leaders in Europe were divided over which side to take, since many of them were German. But Weizmann convinced them that there was only one clear choice. You could find a prominent Zionist leaders in the German army and in the French army and the British army, shooting each other. We don't take any side. Weizmann said, no, 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 it's a huge historical mistake. We have to take sides, and it's the British one. And to say it in 1915, I it was crazy, because who knew that the British were going to, um, uh, to take all, all the Middle East? I mean, it was a war. I mean, nobody knew how it will finish. Weizmann's groundbreaking production of acetone had been invaluable to the British war effort. And David Lloyd George, the Minister of Munitions offered him a reward. Weizmann answered, nothing for me, but I would like you to do something for my people. Lloyd George later wrote in his memoirs, that was the origin of the famous Balfour Declaration, the letter written by Weizmann's old friend, Lord Balfour, now an ardent Zionist. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Weizmann's miracle is the fact that he convinced Arthur James Balfour that to promise a national home for the Jews in Palestine is not the Jewish interest, it's not the Zionist interest, it's the British one. All the rest is history. With the Jewish homeland now on the horizon, Weizmann met with Amir Faisal, the leader of the Arab national movement. The two signed an agreement that the Arabs would encourage the Jewish national home in Palestine while the Jews would help the Arabs develop their natural resources. After signing the agreement, Faisal made the following statement. We Arabs look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. I look forward, and my people with me look forward, to a future in which we will help you, and you will help us. But that sentiment only lasted a few months, since the British refused to grant the Arabs immediate independence. Faisal reneged on the deal. This is very unfortunate. 
because the recognition that uh, the land belongs to the Jews would have not only created a peaceful relationship, but it would have made the entire region successful, prosperous, stable, and certainly would have saved a lot, a lot of blood. In April of 1920, Weizmann traveled to the Italian town of San Remo, where Allied leaders met to divide the land they had conquered in World War I. The final San Remo resolution also included the Balfour Declaration of 1917. The San Remo Conference was a turning point for the Zionists. What was once a dream was now international law. They would finally have a state and the British would be responsible for helping them create it. Britain's foreign minister later referred to the resolution as the Magna Carta of the Jewish people. Palestine was now in the hands of the British, and the 1920s and 30s saw unprecedented growth in the Jewish community. Much of it was spearheaded by Weizmann. He helped develop a plant to mine phosphates at the Dead Sea and a hydroelectric power plant on the Jordan River. And in 1921, he and fellow scientist Albert Einstein raised money for what would later become the Technion Institute in Haifa. By the end of the 1930s, the shadow of war loomed over Europe, and the British were more worried about fighting Hitler than creating a Jewish state. But that didn't stop Weizmann from asking. Throughout the war, he pushed for the creation of a Jewish brigade, which didn't happen until the end of the war. He also lobbied Britain to let thousands of European Jews into Palestine, which didn't happen at all. After the war, he renewed his calls for a state. By now, there was a new American president in the White House, and it was Weizmann's job to win him over. Harry Truman comes into the White House overwhelmed. He says, I felt like the sun and the moon and the stars had fallen on me. Truman has to get his own bearings in office. It's just a very, very complicated job. And all of a sudden, on top of this, comes this Palestine file. And the Palestine file is triply complicated. On the one hand, you have Jewish leaders and Jewish advisors and millions of non-Jews saying, the right thing to do is to give the Jewish people a homeland in Palestine. You have the Arab dimension where Arabs with oil money and with tens of millions, and hundreds of millions of people are saying, no way, we don't want a Jewish state in here. I repeat again. In 1947, the British announced that they were withdrawing from Palestine. And in November, the United Nations voted to partition the land into two states, one Arab and one Jewish. President Truman supported the move at first, but four months later, he wavered under pressure from his State Department. Weizmann and other Jewish leaders were in a state of near panic. They needed American support. But Truman's door had been slammed shut. He also doesn't like to be pushed around. And as the lobbying gets more intense, he shuts down. I've had enough. But what do you do? History is knocking on the door. Things are changing. There's a date now. May 15th, 1948, when Israel's become a state, when the British are going to leave. What's going to happen? What do you do? Weizmann confided his fears to American Zionist Dewey Stone, who then told his friend Frank Goldman. The two were attending a dinner for a Jewish organization in Boston. I just spent the day with Chaim Weizmann. He thinks that he can convince Truman to turn around on petition, but he can't get into the White House. Truman is shutting everyone out. I think I can help. Goldman had just met Harry Truman's old friend and business partner, Eddie Jacobson, one of the few people with an open door to the Oval Office. They decided to telephone Jacobson in Missouri right away but neither of them had any coins. So they had to go from guest to guest until they had scraped up enough change to make the long distance call. 
Eddie? It's Frank Goldman. I have a favor to ask you. Jacobson came east on the next train and called Truman immediately. Truman agreed to see him on one condition. There would be no talk of Palestine. Eddie, you son of a gun. You promised you wouldn't say a word. Mr. President, I didn't say a word. But I think of all those homeless Jews, homeless for thousands of years. And then I think of Dr. Weissman. I can't help it. He spent his entire life working for a homeland for the Jews, and now he's old and he's sick. He just wants Eddie, to see. That's enough. Now that's the last word. <laughs> that's all they want to talk about. We talked about this and that, but just, just too much going every on. once in a while, a big tear would roll down his cheek. Eddie, you bald-headed son of a gun. I ought to have you thrown right out of here. You knew perfectly well that I couldn't stand to see you cry. Mr. President, thank you. After he was gone, I picked up the phone and called the State Department. I told them I was going to see Weitzman. And well, you should have heard the carrying on. And what we also have to remember is that there are very powerful forces saying, don't do it. And especially in the State Department, but also at this time in the Department of Defense, the leaders and also the main bureaucrats are saying, don't do it. And Harry Truman, to his credit, despite tremendous pressure from both sides, makes the decision based on what Harry Truman believes. The clock was ticking, and Heim Weizmann had just one chance to change Truman's mind. He was great in a face-to-face -face talk. He could say the right thing at the right time. He could tell you really what you want to hear. The basic things, the back in the advice and look on his eyes and said, well, historically, nobody will remember you if you reject the, Zion, the, the Zionists or the state for the Jews. If you support it, you will be remembered. This is Chaim Weizmann. While Chaim Weizmann gained international support for a Jewish state, Another man was in Palestine building that state from the ground up. Tomorrow on the 700 Club, the story of Israel's founder and father, David Ben-Gurion.